So uh, welcome to uh, uh, SNU Data Science Seminar. Uh, today we have a very distinguished speaker, Mr. Tehi Nam. Uh, he is uh, uh, one of the most successful venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. And he, he has been running, uh, he founded and uh, has been running uh, Stone Ventures, I think uh, almost 20 years. And uh, today, uh, he's going to talk about how can Korean data companies uh, break into the U.S. market. Let me give a brief introduction to uh, Dr. Nam. He did and then did uh, his at University of Chicago, and then I think he was in. Uh, uh, at the uh, Wilson Sonsini, uh, the Silicon Valley's uh, uh, venture law firm, and then uh, he started the company, and then he started uh, uh, the current uh, venture capital. Uh, I think you know there, there can be a list of uh, introduction, you know, interesting uh, things that I can talk about, but uh, I want to st uh, stop here and uh, uh, give more time to Mr. Uh, Tehinam. Well, thank okay, you. Very, all yours. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, as I'm giving the talk, please feel free to interrupt me with questions anytime. It actually makes it more interesting when I uh, give a talk. And uh, and the other is I, I really enjoy uh, uh, participating at uh, you know uh, the data new data science school. I think what uh, the mission of the school and what how it's going to transform you know, data science in Korea will be very important. So as you mentioned, uh, the, the topic I want to talk about today is how can Korean data companies and also experts succeed in the United States? And uh, to just give the answer up front, what I'm going to talk about is the way to succeed if you can remember, there's two things is you need to surf a big wave and you need to unlearn Confucius. Those are the and one is our data, but all Korean experts can succeed. Important concept it is, is that uh, what we see a lot of times is people struggling. You know, they're struggling to get a job at a, a, a big data company, whether it's Facebook, Google, they're struggling to raise venture capital money. You know, they're struggling to uh, get their first customers or to really succeed in the market. And what it really feels like is paddling. You know, when you paddle, you work so hard, uh, and, but you go a very short distance. So, when you paddle, it's all about, you know, for all that hard work, you get minimal results. But if you can transition from paddling to surfing, you feel this momentum pushing you and you can achieve so much for a lot less work. And so it's really about how do you transition from going from paddling to surfing? And it turns out that I'm not a big surfer. Actually, I'm scared of the water, so I don't surf. But one of my colleagues at work, he loves to surf. He surfs about twice a week. So when I, we talked about this idea, he sent me like five YouTube videos, two books from Amazon, and, and countless blog posts. And so what I summarized all that was three things. is To surf, you have to find the wave, you have to catch the wave, and then you need to ride the wave. And, and so what do you mean by all this is so you know using this meta metaphor to sort of surfing to success in the United States is that if you find the wave you especially if you find a big wave it creates a lot of momentum and interest by catching the wave you get a lot of leads so you get a lot of chances it's like getting a lot of job interviews it's like getting meeting a lot of potential customers you get a lot of chances and interest because you've caught the wave and then lastly, riding the wave is all about closing customers or closing uh, get, you know, the job interview. And ultimately, it comes down to selling vision. And how do you sell vision? 
Um, and, and that's a picture of my uh, colleague surfing in Costa Rica. Uh, as I said, he, uh, he loves to uh, surf all around the world. And he goes around trying to find the way from any place around the world. So let's talk more about finding the way. Well, when you talk to surfers, what they say is, is that finding the wave is really tough when you're in the water because you know, you're paddling, you're cold, you're, you know, you're burning a lot of energy. And so trying to find the right wave is tough when you're in it. And so what's good is to just sort of step back, you know, step back and sort of see where the general kind of waves are and, uh, um, and where the waves are breaking, where the new big wave is, and look at where the other surfers are going. So you, by doing this, you could really understand where is the wave. Now, you might ask, okay, we've been talking a lot, a lot about surfing, but how does this sort of finding the wave now then connect to like venture capital investments, startups, uh, so forth? The way we look at investments is, is that we're looking for surfers that will surf the next big wave because the wave is what makes a small company into a very large company and made very successful. So in particular, in 2010, uh, this was our investment thesis back in 2010, is that we saw software as a service as like a big wave. And it was going to come and crush this, uh, what people had done before, which is sort of selective automation using on-premise software like from SAP, from Oracle, uh, to build ERP or other systems. But that selective automation was very expensive. And so as a result, people only used it for mission critical. But with software as a service, you could automate everything and it enabled the digital transformation. So another way of looking at it is like, this is a picture from the tsunami in Japan. Um, and when you have a big wave that comes in, like the digital transformation, it just crushes everything. And this is a quote from the former CEO of Accenture, who said that digital is the main reason just over half of the companies in the Fortune 500 have disappeared since 2000. So what you're seeing is software as a service is providing this new technology wave, which enables the digital transformation and causing companies to change. And so this was our investment thesis in 2000. It worked uh, 2010. It worked very well. You know, I invested in Marketo when there were 14 employees and we exited at 2 billion. And uh, we have other companies like TalkDesk, Algolia, which are doing very well with the, the digital transformation. But then the next question is, so this is the, this wave is like, what happens after the digital transformation? And so we've been thinking a lot about this over the last few years. And we get insights in particular by looking at Amazon. You know, Amazon right now obviously is one of the giant tech companies, but more importantly, Amazon has its own data source through Amazon Prime. It's a huge source of data from 100 million plus Amazon Prime shoppers that they can see all the behavior. And then second, they have AWS, which is their obvious cloud-based infrastructure, which they built for themselves originally. They didn't build AWS for others, but for themselves so that they can have scalable IT. So if you look at Amazon, what we learned was is that as companies went through this digital transformation, started deploying SaaS, what, and start to automate everything, what happens is that you invariably get lots of data. You get this huge amount of data so that even though you're not Facebook, Google, or Amazon, and just a normal, let's say, retail company, you're a pharmacy, you're a hospital, Next thing you know, you have a lot of data generated as you're automating every part of your workflow. And so you have a chance, in other words, to be like Facebook, like Google, more importantly, like Amazon. So what does that mean? That means that the next wave that we see is what AI and cloud is driving, what software as a service drove over 10 years ago, so that AI and cloud 
is this new wave which takes advantage of all this data and is now enabling companies to become data companies so that they can make data-driven actions. And so what we see here is companies now are making this transition first with a digital transformation and now in order to become data companies. And so the way we look at this is, uh, um, you know, there are many articles which come out like this article in the Economist about data being the most valuable resource and all of that. But ultimately it comes down to the way we look at it is to survive in this new environment or to thrive, companies must become data companies in the new data economy. And so that's the wave that we're investing in is this idea of how AI and cloud is causing companies to feel they need to transition, transform themselves into data companies in the new data economy. And so that is the wave that we're investing in, but that's also the wave that's uh, impacting, you know, established companies, startups, incumbents, everyone, because they see this uh, transition that is going on. So the first thing is to understand sort of in the big picture, these kind of big waves that hit, and as a result are transforming companies, economies, and industries. So with that, it's about surfing to success. It's, as I mentioned, the first thing is you have to find the wave. Because if you don't find the wave, you know, it's hard to surf. So finding the wave, and obviously the bigger the wave, the better, because it creates a lot of momentum. And so now when you have the wave, the next thing is you got to catch the wave. And by catching it, as I mentioned, you get a lot of chances. So this is what we see a lot, and sometimes we're in it ourselves. This is an example of four surfers uh, all hitting the wave. And you can see one has caught the wave. Three are so close, but they didn't. And these three are so frustrated as a result. And uh, this is a common experience, unfortunately. It's like watching four startups that are trying to take leverage to ride this wave. One startup has caught the wave, three have not. They're so close, but they did not. Or it could be four people, very qualified people, interviewing for a job. One ends up catching it, and three did not. So what you see is, is that, as I said, it's like these surfers are so close, they found the right wave, they're all there, but how did this one person catch it while the other three uh, did not? Well, this is where I went and talked to my uh, uh, surfing uh, colleague, and you know we went through it. It turns out in surfing, what you need to do is you need to paddle over to the peak of the wave, and then you surf with the wave. And so there's a certain spot in the wave that you need to find, and it's called the peak. Um, in, in the tech world, there's something similar to the peak of the wave, and that's what we call, you need to paddle to the urgent pain. And urgent pain is, if you're a startup selling, it answers the question, why buy now? If you're interviewing for a job, it's really, why should they hire you now? It's not like why they should buy six months from now, buy two years from now, but why buy today? Why buy right now? And so if you could identify that urgent pain in the wave, then that's what gives them that urgency and the pain is why they need to solve it today. So identifying that part becomes quite valuable. Um, many times the urgent pain is different than the founding idea. For example, one of the companies I've worked with, Mobile Iron, you know, uh, I helped start the company, we took it public. Uh, when we first came out with Mobile Iron, the founding idea was for this pain point, which is to manage and secure heterogeneous smartphones, whether it's Symbian, iPhone, or others at the time. Um, they came out with a product, but it was very hard to get customers. You know, they would get like one customer, five customers a quarter, very slow, very painful. They then saw at that point the iPhone taking off 
and then they switched over to just securing the iPhone as the primary focus. And all of a sudden, that was the urgent pain. And people started then buying mobile iron instead of five a quarter. They started getting 50 customers a quarter, 100 customers a quarter, 500 customers a quarter. Because what happened is, is that executives would get iPhones for Christmas. They would then come back to the office and say, I want to switch from BlackBerry to iPhone. And uh, the IT would say, well, we don't support uh, iPhones. We only support Blackberries. And the CEOs and execs would say, that's an unacceptable answer. So IT was forced to uh, uh, support all the iPhones. So that's an example of finding an urgent pain, which answers the question, why buy now? And many times it is that it's different from the founding idea. So it sounds like founder heresy, but listening to the customer and finding the urgent pain is critical. And then once you find the urgent pain, then it's to then surfing with the wave and how to become strategic to the customer. I, I think in this situation where, you know, obviously many of you are students or many of you are thinking about starting companies or finding research projects, you have actually a different question, which isn't just catching the wave, it's about which wave to catch. In other words, do you want to solve today's urgent pain or do you want to solve tomorrow's urgent pain. If you're a startup selling a product today, you have to solve today's urgent pain because if you don't, you will die. Uh, so if you're a startup selling a product, you have no choice. But if you're thinking about doing a new startup or, doing a, or becoming a researcher, it's important actually not to solve so much today's urgent pain but what do you think will be tomorrow's urgent pain? And obviously the risk is, is that the wave may never come. But coming up and uh, uh, identifying this urgent pain at the right time that you're ready becomes important. Otherwise, you, it's very easy to sort of wipe out. The third thing I want to talk about is, uh, um, you know, after catching the wave, it's about riding the wave. And think about, you know, you've done all this work to sort of find the, to find the right wave. Then you caught the urgent pain, found the urgent pain, and you caught the wave. But then if you don't ride the wave, it's like going through all this work. And, uh, uh, and, and losing and not being able to monetize the benefits. So as I thought about like, what is the most important skill in terms of, in order to ride the wave, it turns out is that you need to learn how to sell vision. And it, it turns, you know, I, I was born in Korea. We immigrated when I was five years old. I grew up and as a very Confucian family. You know, my father was a professor at Severance. You know, my brother, older brother is a medical school professor. So, you know, I was raised to be a Confucian scholar. You know, I was raised to be very good on exams. But uh, uh, one thing I, I wasn't really taught was how to sell, how to sell vision. And in order to succeed in the United States, it's really important to learn how to sell vision. You know, whether you're selling to customers, you know, that is selling vision. If you're raising money from investors, that's selling vision. If you want someone to hire you, that's also selling vision. So learning how to sell was something that uh, uh, was very difficult for me to learn. And uh, I didn't learn it really until after I uh, uh, started working and uh, uh, graduated from school. So for me to sell vision, what was important is, you know, I had to unlearn a lot of things. And so I wanna share with you 
uh, some study, this study that uh, in MIT. And what basically it said is, is that uh, explains why American business leaders are more likely to be Indian than Chinese. And when I say Chinese, it means East Asian. So it includes Chinese, Koreans, or Japanese, basically Confucian, you know, countries. So let's first look on the left-hand side. These are CEOs of S&P 500 companies. So these are the public companies in the United States. And uh, what you can see is that in 2010, there were three East Asian CEOs, there were eight South Asian CEOs, and uh, 433 white CEOs. If you look at 2017, the number is still three for East Asian, 13 for South Asian, and uh, for whites is 440. Um, I don't have the number for right now, but I think the number is more than 13. If you look at the companies of Google, Adobe, IBM, MasterCard, Micron, Microsoft, Nokia, they're all Indian CEOs. Now, if we look at just, uh, so you can say, well, maybe CEOs are just different, okay? Uh, but if you look on the other side, this is a, a, an article that came out of The uh, Economist that looks at income and education amongst foreign-born population in America selected by country of birth in 2012. Um, so the right-hand side is percentage of population with postgraduate education and uh, uh, the y-axis is average family income. <coughs> so for South Koreans here, average family income in the United States looks like about $70,000. 15% have a postgraduate education. Obviously everyone coming out of, you know, SNU School of Graduate Education will, will have the, you know, grad in the postgraduate education. At the other extreme, you have Mexico because there are a lot of, uh, uh, Mexican immigrants, you know, that are less educated. But then you look on the far right, and there are Indians. You know, almost 40% are postgraduate education, and the average income is $110,000. I think the average income in the U.S. is probably around 60 to 80 or something like that. But you can see Indians are much higher than, like, Chinese or South Korea. So on the right-hand side, this is talking about Indians in general, but on the left-hand side, we're talking about just CEOs of uh, American companies. Um, <clears throat> so then the question becomes, the MIT study goes in and talks more about why are there more South Asian than there are East Asian CEOs in the United States? And they go in and they explore four reasons as they're trying to explain why American business leaders are more likely to be Indian than East Asian. The first thing is prejudice. You know, are Americans more prejudiced against, you know, East Asians than Indians? The answer is no. I mean, whether you're a South Asian or an East Asian, if you're to an American, you're a foreigner. So either way, you know, there's equal amount of prejudice that they have to overcome. Next is motivation. You know, uh, Indians are, have a lot of motivation, but so do Chinese and Koreans. So there's no difference statistically in motivation. How about aptitude? No difference there either. The area that they found major difference between these two population groups is assertive. So what does assertive mean? Because you know, after I read this, I was sort of puzzled by it. And so I actually copied on the next slide some words from this article if I want to share with you. And it says, when it comes to gaining leadership of a major US company, South Asians fare better than East Asians because they demonstrate more of the assertiveness that American leaders are supposed to have. So what does it mean assertiveness that American leaders are supposed to have? It says the article cite research and suggests that the prototypical American late leader blazes a trail from the front of the group while the East Asian leader trails behind the group as a steady protector. So if you wanna think about it, 
who does Americans think of as leaders? Think of Captain America. You know, so if you like watching Marvel comics, it's like Captain America, Wonder Woman, you know, the people that can go to the front line, they lead by example, and they're assertive and good speakers. And then it goes on to say, South Asian culture encourages assertiveness. I added the word external, so let's, we should ignore that initially. The article said, South Asian culture encourages assertiveness. Indian people tend to be forceful, lively, use a verb body language and think out loud, whereas Japanese people tend to be modest and quiet, use little body language and think in silence. So basically what it means is that if you're vocal, talk a lot, to Americans you sound assertive. Even though internally you could be as assertive, as demanding, and so forth. It's the difference between this internal and external impression which becomes very important if you want to succeed in American business society. So let's talk about why does that impact now to Confucius? So I looked at myself, you know, looking at my case study and talk to other friends and about, you know, how East Asians can sell vision in the United States. And it turns out for me to do that, I had to unlearn Confucius. You know, Confucianism is a great philosophy. It's obviously helped East Asian countries a lot. There are all these articles about how Confucian doctrine was instrumental to the rapid industrialization and success of Korea. So I'm not trying to say Confucius is bad. You know, there are many aspects of it which are fantastic. There are certain aspects of it, for me personally, I, I had to unlearn. One is this idea about respecting hierarchy, this whole idea about harmony, which means avoiding conflict, and this whole thing about humility um, and so forth. So I wanna share about this as sort of a couple of specific examples of how Confucian values uh, and I felt I was raised about as Confucian as you can be, held me back and how I had to unlearn it in order for me to sell myself and to sell vision. So the first example I wanna give was when I was interviewing for a job. You know, I was interviewing for a job in law school, uh, at a law school, and uh, you know, when I sent my resumes, I would get all these interviews. You know, I was Phi Beta Kappa at Harvard. I graduated magna cum laude. You know, I had all these awards, accomplishments. To be honest, I overstudied while I was in college, so I regret that. But anyway, but that's a while ago. So in terms of resume, I, I had a very good resume. Um, so I would get a lot of interviews. But then when I actually went and interviewed the first year, uh, my uh, uh, acceptance rate was less than 5%. Not very good. So I thought about it a lot about what did I do wrong in my interviews? Because uh, uh, you know I, I went in looking like I should and others. So I, I, I was uh, fortunate that uh, uh, um, I was able to actually look, read uh, uh, one of the interviewer notes and all that. And, and uh, basically the summary was, you know, seems like a really smart guy, uh, did very well in school, but he comes across as such a meek guy that we're not sure that he can survive in our competitive company. And I read that, I was sort of like stunned. How did they think I was me and not uh, uh, competitive? Because I, no, I actually thought myself of being overly competitive, if anything, not <laughs> underly competitive. <laughs> you know, as an immigrant, you know, you, you learn if you don't compete and win, you die. So, you know, uh, competition was not something I felt I, I lacked. But it turns out when you interview, you only meet a person for one hour. It's not like the person gets to see all of you. And so and this is why I showed this picture of an iceberg, is that 
it's all about in one hour, what do you show about yourself? You know, what do you show in one hour, that tip of the iceberg from which the interviewer will make their impression when they want to hire you? And so what I did was when I interviewed was I just sort of followed the interviewer, answer the question. And the whole point of the interview from my perspective was, well, to just have a nice interview, you know, where we sort of like each other. And I thought that's what the goal of the interview was initially. Uh, and, and I was wrong. By doing that, I just came across as sort of this meek and mild sort of Asian who's good at studying, good at exams, but uh, obviously cannot be a leader and be successful. So next year, I changed my interview technique. And uh, instead of just sort of following the interview, I had uh, uh, also my program and sort of asking specific questions on like, why should I join your company? You know, uh, how can I succeed to become successful, to be one of the partners, leaders there and so forth. So really showing that, you know, here I am, I'm also trying to control my own destiny, be assertive, not just be a nice meek person. And all of a sudden my acceptance rate went from, a uh, higher rate went from 5% to 95%. You know, fundamentally, it's the same person. It's not like in one year I changed myself. It's not like my exam scores went better. It's not like a lot of things changed. But it's about what do you show in that one hour? Um, and, and so, you know, the Confucian traits that come up uh, before, such as, uh, you know, humility, harmony, uh, respect are all important, but they can hold you back in sort of conveying the uh, proper assertive manner to show that, you know, you can be that leader in an American society, in an American company, and that's important to getting hired. It also turns out to be critical to fundraising, because if you want to raise money from American VCs, the impression is in that one hour meeting. Um, so there again, you know, that coming up with that impression is important. To be honest, you know, we as investors now, because we invest globally, are now understanding uh, founders from different parts of the world have different personalities. And so we know that Germans tend to undersell and Israelis and Indians tend to oversell. So, you know, we sort of use that as adjustment about what reality is. Uh, but still, that ability to, uh, to sell vision becomes, is very important and is illustrated about how you, what you show in that one hour. Um, and, and as I mentioned, it, it was a, a stunning revelation for me when I read these interview notes about myself. And as a result, that really caused me to change. The second example that I want to share with you uh, was a, a fairly new uh, learning. So the interview was back when I was uh, coming out of school. This is uh, uh, fairly new. And it's about social media. Uh, you know, we all talk about social media and the importance of social media and it's becoming quite pervasive and everything. Um, and I, I had the fortune of a, a you know, I hired someone that used to work for me to join Storm as a, a, a venture partner. Um, and then he succeeded in a year to become the social media guru about software investing and taking companies from zero to a hundred million dollars. Even though he took his company from zero to five million and sold it. But the ability to use social media uh, was something that really struck me and, uh, uh, and to understand the power of, of social media. And, and so as was going through it and then analyzing it, what I learned is that the first thing with social media is you can access anyone anywhere. 
So all of a sudden, social media has made distribution of ideas, content, but basically ideas. You can have your ideas be available anywhere around the world. It it's really has broken up distribution. In the past, for ideas to get communicated, it had to go into newspapers, it had to go into magazines. So journalists and media used to control distribution of ideas. But now with social media, um, ideas can go anywhere. The flip side of that, because there's so many ideas and there's no filters, it can go anywhere, is, is that it's become very noisy. And so no, all these ideas, visions, and so forth are all blended together into one, this social media noise. And so the question is, how do you rise above the noise in social media? It turns out, if you, everything you talk about is about harmony, uh, social media considers you boring and no one follows you. So harmony is great in a team environment, but from a social media standpoint, it, it's the easiest way to be blended in with the noise. And the way people break out is by being authentic and edgy, you know, to be provocative. So edgy is what gets the attention, but it's easy to check whether or not it's authentic. So you need authentic and edgy as a way of rising above the noise. And then the other mention I mentioned about is, is that social media is about how you can access everyone and not just family. And, and so, you know, watching this colleague in our office who would so, say such controversial things um, to become edgy became those sound bites, uh, but he did it in such an authentic manner that he was able to rise above the noise and create this huge following. Um, and, and so that's something in watching him, what we realized that we need to do too. And so we as a firm and individuals have really been leveraging uh, uh, this quite a bit in our own ways though, to, uh, to rise above the noise. And for us, uh, it's about authentic, great content that we think will help the, uh, uh, the entrepreneurs is what we're doing. And that's what led me to write a couple of books and then to give talks and others as the ability to rise above the noise. So if you want to step back and ask yourself, though, who is the best, I think, in the world in leveraging social media to rise above the noise, it's actually Donald Trump. You know, that's how Donald Trump became president. You know, Hillary Clinton had twice the amount of resources, twice the amount of money, twice the amount of staff, better name recognition, everything. But he really leveraged social media and the media that they always talked about Donald Trump. Whether you hate Donald Trump or love Donald Trump, it was always Donald Trump. And so by doing that, he was able to rise above the noise and became quite effective at uh, marketing. It, it's something that we find that uh, startups are, or you know, younger people in their career are much better able to do than people later in their career. Later in their career, you know, as an incumbent, you have to protect uh, uh, relationships, you have to protect legacy. There's so many things that you have to sort of protect and pursue harmony that people later in their career, um, in general, cannot be thought leaders in social media. Whereas if you're new in your career or a startup, um, it's very easy to be provocative because by nature you're gonna be disrupting. So this is a great opportunity as you're starting something, whether your career or a company, to be both authentic and provocative and to rise above the noise and become a thought leader in your space. Because by being a thought leader, um, 
you are in a better position here to then to ride this wave, to catch the wave, and to find the wave that you want to be the thought leader of. And it turns out that this is a time where, you know, being Korean, I think, is a huge benefit in the United States. Because this is an article from the Wall Street Journal, which is talking about how Korean pop culture is having this moment in the United States. You know, it started with K-pop, you know, with uh, Gangnam Style, but then BTS, and then Parasite. But most importantly for Americans is actually Korean baseball, you know? Sports in the U.S. now are completely shut down. So there's no baseball, there's no football, basketball, or anything. And so if you're a sports person, what's the only sports you can watch? Korean baseball. So in fact, I know uh, American friends that are uh, 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 videotaping Korean baseball because it's shown at uh, uh, different times and watching it during the day. So as you can see, you know, being Korean, being Koreanness is actually a positive, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, not a negative. Oops. So being Korean is something that you should be proud of and really go into what is it that is authentic and passionate about and express yourself in that area, in whatever you're doing. So you can become a thought leader in your space. And by doing that, you know, you're in the best position then to, to ride the wave. So that's why I want to mention, you know, if you, to succeed in the United States, it's, I find this surfing metaphor very helpful. As I said, it's, when you're not surfing, you feel like you're paddling. And when you're paddle, it's so tiring and you get so little results. Um, but to, to surf, you have to, you know, find the wave and big waves are get better. Second is you gotta catch the wave and that's to find the urgent point when you're ready for it. And, and lastly and most importantly, you know, you have to ride the wave. Because, you know, if you do all this hard work of finding it and catching it, but you can't ride it, it's, as I said, very frustrating. In order to ride the wave in the United States, it's really important to learn how to sell vision as an American, to, to Americans. And what that means is, you know, it means about unlearning Confucius and learning a bit more about Marvel superheroes. You know, there's a reason why superheroes are popular in the United States, because they epitomize what Americans view of leaders versus an East Asian view of what is a leader in the United States. And so what I find helpful is for me is when I said unlearn Confucius is not to unlearn what's inside of you or the core of who you are. You know, you should always be who you are. So if you're a Confucian in your core, be Confucian in your core. But when you express yourself externally, whether in that one hour interview or in social media, is to find parts of yourself that you want to convey that and share that uh, uh, will create that audience and will command, uh, people will recognize that you are a leader in the American sense as well too. So with that, I just wanna end by saying thank you. Appreciate uh, this opportunity. And I'm also here, open to answer any questions that people may have along the way too. Well, thank you for your talk. Uh, yeah, let's uh, ask questions. Uh. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, I want to talk about Donald Trump because I can't help myself. So, um, so That's you mentioned about so people powerful. People cannot yeah. stop talking about him. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you you mentioned uh, you talked about the importance of rising above the noise. 
Um, so I'm an assistant professor in the math department here, and um, your talk resonated with me in the, because um, for me, I need to sell my sort of vision regarding research. I need to tell students, hey, this is um, a very promising research plan. So it's probably not the same as selling a, a business um, idea, but I think there are some similarities. Um, yeah, I would say it's 99% the same. Okay. So um, I actually pay, pay close attention to the US politics and, um, and I observe Donald Trump and I actually um, at some point try to think about, is there something that I can learn from this person who is clearly a, in some way a good communicator? And um, I did spend some effort, but I couldn't really get something that was actionable for me because um, sure he does grab a lot of attention, but I do want to be um, a positive influence to the world. I don't, at least I don't want to be a negative influence to the world. And I also don't want to you know, disgrace myself. So, um, so since you mentioned Donald, since you brought up Donald Trump, is there something to learn from his style of communication while you know, not being a bad person? Absolutely. So Donald Trump is a fantastic market, brilliant marketer. And you know, people may not like him as a leader, but he's an absolute brilliant marketer. And so let's go back to how does he leverage social media to rise above the noise? The first thing is it needs to be a little bit edgy. If, if everyone just talks motherhood and apple pie, there's nothing interesting there. So think about parts of your research, your ideas and so forth, which uh, um, is more provocative, you know? Um, and that's why I say it's sort of anti-Confucian because Confucian is about harmony, it's about blending, you know, all that. And here, you want something that is edgy, provocative, but it has to be authentic. It has to be something that you really believe. So what works for you will not work for someone else or someone else for you. So it doesn't have to be the same message, but what you want is you want a message which is authentic, edgy, and also sound bites help too. That's why like, he likes to call his, poly, you know, his opponents like Sleepy Joe or things like that because people remember three words. Like I'm hoping out of this presentation, you remember surf the wave and unlearn Confucius. So repetition and sound bites, that, that could be a good. Uh, right. <clears throat> but if I it. said unlearn Confucius in like 50 words, no one's going to remember that. Certainly. So in relation to what you're doing in your research, there is something I'm sure you're passionate about that you really believe. So you get, it, it starts with passion. What are you passionate about? Based on that passion, you're gonna find that there's something that you believe that is different than what most of the other people believe. Okay? Because that's what research is. You're trying to discover new things right. anyway. So it's something that you believe that others don't. By definition, that's provocative. The fact that you believe in others, that means it should be provocative. It's just how you then present it. You can present it in a very blending manner, but then it sounds boring. Or you can mention, you know, saying this is, it's how it's different and it's gonna really change. So you do that. And then with a few words that people can remember what it is, then next thing you know, you can become a thought leader. So let me, yeah, let me interrupt a little bit. So there's a question uh, on the Zoom chat window. Okay. Uh, you might want to uh, take a look at. And before that, uh, I should have mentioned the, your book, uh, From Survivor to Thriver. <laughs> so, right. Right. Uh, yeah, maybe, you know, you can talk a little bit about your book, you know, two books. And essentially, you covered the ideas uh, with the pictures in your presentation, but maybe. Right. The, the two books are a little bit different. So the... Um, you know, I, I've invested in almost 200 B2B software companies, and I was an applied math major in college, and so you look for patterns of success and failure. And so the first book is How to Build an Enterprise Company, 
like raising a child, how do you build an enterprise company? And the, the key element there we talk about is how to unlock growth. And, and so that's what that book is about. The second book is uh, about the people side of uh, building an enterprise company is, is that once you unlock growth, what happens is we found that uh, uh, people need to change or be changed. When I say be changed, you have to, in other words, let people go and replace them with someone that can then help take the company to the next stage in the journey. And so the second book is really to help uh, people um, change themselves through the, the startup journey. And one key element is that you need to unlearn yourself because what made you so good at, let's say the founding stage is gonna hurt you at the scaling stage. So those are the, the two books. Um, so I wanna go back to the, the, the questions here. So it says, uh, uh, I have one quick question on the AI cloud wave. Uh, you mentioned today, given that AI can be applied almost anywhere, could you share a particular area where solutions to AI, in your opinion? So what we're seeing is AI getting applied everywhere. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, There's so many examples, but like one is, you know how you'll have uh, salespeople call you on the telephone, right? And they try to pitch you products over the telephone. Well, there are companies now doing very well. They record the telephone call, apply transcription to transcribe it, use natural language processing, and then they start analyzing all these calls then to then uh, provide guided selling to the salespeople. So now you can do instantaneous guided selling to salespeople uh, to help close more deals over the telephone. So this is an example of using NLP and uh, other technology for basically uh, inside sales calls. Um, we're seeing uh, uh, AI being used inside the call center for uh, uh, responding to calls. I mean, I think you know every part of workflow, anytime you automate workflow, you get data and then AI will apply that data to improve that workflow using AI. So that's why I feel like every SaaS application will become AI enabled. Um, the, the next question here is uh, setting aside assertiveness, isn't American culture founder and technology Christianity? Yes. yes. Um, so, there are a lot of aspects about Confucian uh, uh, culture and values which are consistent with Judeo-Christian views of fairness, of, of what is a good person, all that. And you're absolutely right that in terms of uh, values and integrity, there is a lot of shareness. And uh, I think that promotes a lot of intermarriages in the United States. So you see a lot of Koreans marrying Americans and so forth. Um, but what I was talking about here was uh, how to be viewed as a successful leader in America. And there are certain aspects of Confucian training, at least when applied to me and some of my friends that I felt would hold us back and viewed as a successful leader in American society. And that's what I was referring to. Um, so you can see, as an investor, I see it that if you see like semiconductor companies, uh, East Asians do very well as CEOs. If you're doing software companies, Indians and Israelis have done very well as software companies. Because it turns out when you sell, sell semiconductor, vision, all that doesn't really matter. You get the semiconductor, you test it, it works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, it takes six months to fix it. If you sell software, you can write software that night, add a feature or something. So vision plays a bigger role in selling software. And so we just see the, the difference in, in that area. To follow up uh, you, on, on that point, uh, what would you suggest uh, for uh, Korea uh, to improve uh, the assertiveness of, you know, or selling the vision? 
you know, in education or in, uh, in whatever. Right. Uh, I, I, I mean, I wish when I was going to school that uh, uh, I had a, a, a class or a seminar on just how to sell. Um, it took me many years to uh, unlearn a lot of my prior training to learn how to sell. Uh, you know, how to accept failure when you sell. You know, when you're in school, anything less than 90% is usually not an A. But in selling, you know, usually uh, you lose. Uh, it's like playing baseball. If you bat 300 in baseball, you're an all star. If you close 30%, that's pretty good. So that means 70% of the time you fail in sales. So a lot of things like that about selling, I, I wish I uh, had learned. When I say sell, I mean learn how to sell vision. Mm -hmm. So I have another question. Sorry that I'm, there's some also the uh, uh, questions on the, on the chat window. Uh, but uh, let me add more, one more question on uh, Korea is uh, strong in uh, hardware, you know, electronics and the semiconductor. So, uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's a, you know, the, the government, there's a talks about the AI chips, you know, and then those chips will be changing uh, the uh, landscape in the future. So, you know, what can Korea do from your perspective? Oh, I, I think Korea has a, 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 a huge opportunity because of uh, the, the talent of Koreans. And that's why I was pointing back to whether it's baseball, K-pop, uh, movies, you know, games, or software, it is that Koreans uh, uh, are incredibly talented and uh, uh, incredibly committed, passionate, and competitive. Um, it's just that uh, 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 just learning the American way of competing, the American game is different than the Korean game. And so learning how to compete in the American game versus the Korean game, I think would be helpful if Koreans want to compete in, you know, play the U.S. game. I think software and data in particular is a, a place that, Koreans can do very well in the United States. And, uh, 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 you know, we raised a new fund and we're very interested in investing in Korean uh, software companies to uh, enter the U.S. market. So we think that there's a, a, a great opportunity, but it does require uh, the ability to sell vision. There's uh, some questions on the chat. <laughs> yeah. So you... I, I'd like to, okay. yes, this uh, last question here about, uh, you know, I mentioned Donald Trump uh, rising above the noise, but you mentioned uh, 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 Elon Musk on his behavior. I don't know if he's more consensual, but he's also, you know, uh, provocative and trying to rise above the noise. I mean, if you look at Elon Musk, Donald Trump, Steve Jobs, uh, it is a common American media technique it is, you know, by being provocative and authentic um, to be able to rise above the noise. To sustain yourself above, that's a harder question, but that's how you separate yourself from the masses. And if you're a new researcher or a new startup, you know, separating from the noise is a key element to becoming successful. And what I found is the best way is to just attack, view it as just attacking with your thought leadership, you know, with what you're passionate about. Um, hi, Mr. Okay. Um, if there's uh, no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for your great talk. And uh, I'd like to host oh, I, you. I, I'm sorry, there is one more question. I, I oh, just, one more question, okay. Uh, do you yeah. think Indians are more successful because they're united, or do you think it's another kind of assertiveness? So, 
Indians are probably the least united people I've met because India itself as a country is a country of like 30 different, they're like 30 different languages. You know, it, it, it's, it's uh, Koreans are so much homogeneous. It, Korea would be like a state within India. You know, India is a collection of different, uh, I remember once I went to India with uh, my part, Indian partner's friend He's from Mumbai, and we went to uh, uh, Madras, and uh, his baggage was lost, and he couldn't talk to any of the people in Madras, even though he, he's Indian, because he spoke Hindu, they didn't speak Hindu, he spoke English, they didn't speak English, he spoke his local dialect, they didn't speak his local dialect, because they were in a different locality. So here were two Indians that couldn't talk to each other. I was stunned. So India is so much more heterogeneous than, let's say, Koreans. Koreans are much more homogeneous. But assertiveness is something that uh, Indians are. Indians and Israelis are two of the more assertive uh, uh, cultures that I've seen. Uh, hello, Mr. Nam. I just read the question. Uh, my name is Qi Xuan, and uh, what I thought about the, the, the kind of united is means um, I heard in a lot of uh, graduate school in the United States, uh, Indian candidates are like, they work together, they share a lot of resources, um, and even, you know, I am a Chinese myself, so uh, I, I even heard that those Indian peers are more united, and if they uh, if they go to an interview, maybe those uh, Indian partners are more prefer uh, prefer Indian candidates because they are more resourceful, <laughs> they are more united. So I just uh, mentioned this this point. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I I I, I no, didn't. Think that, no, that is a good point, and uh, they are. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, and you know, the Indian community actively tries to help each other in that manner. But I, I think uh, so does the, the Chinese community and the, uh, uh, the Ukraine community here too. But uh, um, the, the, you know, every group works together to, to compete as tribes. Um, but I, I think the assertiveness is quite different because we just look in our portfolio of companies and uh, uh, half the founders are Indian. Uh, so do you have any advices or say like how Chinese people or how East Asian people can do better in, you know, um, help their, themselves or like uh, be more assertive to successful in the, in the U.S.? Yes, uh, I think, uh, uh, I just look at myself. Uh, uh, I, I, I believe that I was just as assertive, if not more assertive than others. It's just how I communicated that, shared it, exposed it externally. And so in my case, uh, uh, at the beginning, I, I was viewed as externally as too meek. And so it's how you um, communicate that externally. I mean, you don't want to be obnoxious, but uh, 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 conveying that kind of assertive leadership here in the U.S. is uh, an important criteria. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can, can I add another question, please? Yeah, so go ahead, yeah. Yes, so first I would like to thank you for your uh, inspirational uh, um, sharing. And um, also you, will, you were mentioning a lot, uh, riding the wave in your, in your talk. Uh, I was thinking that actually maybe the US is also a market that is mature and where opportunities are less than in uh, developing countries. And I myself come from Morocco, so uh, I was uh, I wanted to have your insight about riding the wave in developing countries. Oh, that obviously uh, uh, developing countries are a great opportunity, and you know, uh, 
uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, there's a, it's like watching a big wave there too. So it, it is a good idea. It's just that for me personally, uh, you know, I, I just focus on B2B software and B2B software is less important in uh, developing countries than B2C software. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, I think we can uh, have more discussion, but uh, maybe we stop here today. And uh, uh, as Corona, you know, the situation comes down, then uh, we like to see Mr. Nam uh, here in uh, SNU or face to face. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, you know that's uh, that's what uh, I want to say. Uh, uh, you know, and then thank you again. Well, thank you very much, and look forward to being at SNU in the near future.